we're back and ready to discuss the most crucial topics concerning the ongoing climate emergency. I came away from COP26, um, well, in, in a really quite intense emotional state. In fact, a few days later, I broke down on national TV um, in a rather mortifying way um, because I just had reached the point after 37 years of sort of sublimating things and rationalizing things and intellectualizing things where I thought, right, we are totally screwed here because <laughs> the people who should be taking it seriously just are doing nothing of the kind. By contrast, and uh, by very great contrast, in the streets, I saw something very exciting taking place, which was uh, a real shift in the, the climate justice, the global climate movement, where it became a genuinely global one. You know, we've often talked about it being a global climate movement, but it has tended, the most prominent people in it have tended to be people like me. Um, but what we saw happening there was um, a real a shift, a sense that it was people from the global south now coming to the forefront of the meeting being uh, of, of the movement, being the most prominent voices and people from the global north stepping back and allowing that to happen. And I think I saw something quite revolutionary and very hopeful taking place there. And so somehow what we've got to do now is to bridge the gap between these two completely different situations. One definition of madness is doing the same thing repeatedly and expecting a different result. Let's not keep doing the same thing. Let, let's we, we've seen tremendous <coughs> innovation in a whole load of other fields when it comes to negotiation in international diplomacy in business in the voluntary sector um family relationships there's been huge innovation worldwide but when it comes to the climate summits it might as well be the, the conference of berlin in 1885 with, with 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 a few large powers carving up the world between them and ignoring everyone else let's bring some of that innovation into this process and let's bring to the very front of this process the people we should be listening to who are the people who are on the front line in other words let's bring the energy that was locked out of that conference into the very heart of it thank you so much for that and um you know i really feel your frustration i've actually i'll admit i've spent many like nights where i've been close to tears, just trying to work out what is that formula that we need to, to, to make the world click? Are there any specific questions you'd like to ask to our, to our wonderful panel of experts here, George? If you were designing it, how would you do it differently? How would you run a COP climate summit? I think uh, one alternative is to look for willing nations to come forward and form a grouping uh, to take the right sort of actions, the sort of actions that we want. What we need also, of course, is to listen to the people on the streets. Mm -hmm. And I have to say that I have said in the past that COP26, if you take it as the moment when all these people gathered together in Glasgow, that moment produced some really remarkably strong uh, things happening. How do we incorporate that into the decision making process at a government level? Um, I do feel the sense of frustration and I agree with that sense of frustration, uh, but I think we should be careful not to throw the baby out of the bathwater as far as the UN process is concerned. Now, what I see is that the way we structured the COPS, and I completely agree with Lavinia about the legitimacy of a forum and a platform where everybody has a voice. But the way we structure the COP is that the, is the COPs become a bank where we are banking commitments. And because every time we don't fulfill on those commitments, you're going to have a run on that bank one day or the other. So to respond to George's provocative and right question, how would I design it differently? In the minimum, I would design COPs as where you bank actions rather than your bank commitments. And that's the shift in the paradigm that we need after nearly 30 years of negotiations. I'm based in Nairobi, but I'm currently in the lakeside city of Kisumu, for those of you who know Kenya. So I'm in a place where we eat a lot of fish, uh, but I'm based in Nairobi. Um, 
I like what George has asked. It's very provocative. I mean, we've had 26, 26 COPs happening and there's no tangible action. And I'm maybe beginning to think it's how we communicate. And I like what uh, Arnaba has said about, you know, banking actions. Maybe it's time for us to start talking about the successes that are coming. Climate change is real, it's affecting everyone. But how do we communicate to elicit public action and participation in a positive way and not just preach gloom and misery and doom? We really need to have a meeting about how we help people deal with climate anxiety and how we are going to deal with not just us, but the new generation that's coming through who feel it much more than, say, my generation or Georgie's generation. It's really important when we're communicating about climate change that we don't just focus in on the, the worst case scenarios. Um, there, there's certainly some really scary aspects of climate change that we really want to make sure that we do everything in our power to avoid. But it's not just about telling people about those worst cases. We also need to be telling people about what are the options if we actually take this ambitious action? What's the more positive future that can lie ahead of us? So we're giving people that vision as to if they take this action, then what would the world look like? And that this is a world that actually is a much better place to, to live in and for your children to live in. I think a key element of com effective communication is knowing your audience and targeting your message to what your audience cares about, to their values. Um, and people do have different values to some extent. So you, you might want to emphasize certain things to business leaders and other things to members of charities or members of the public, etc. But we also have a lot in common. And there's really strong research now showing that um, we have we have a lot of values in common, including fairness is really important to people, uh, nature and, and valuing the countryside, particularly sort of your national or local countryside. Um, family and community is hugely strong across across nations and across people within nations. So I think we also need to really um, focus our messaging around what we have in common. The thing that frustrated me the most out of the COP process was that there didn't seem to be too much of a recognition. Um, across governments that some of the areas where we have made some progress and yes admittedly we haven't seen emissions coming down as we would want to but the places where we have made progress and, and these are things like the cost of renewable um, power batteries solicited lighting those were due to to a large extent public policies so uh, when we talk about what um, could make a difference or, or what are things that are positive but that we should build on and not just forget about is in this question of what governments can do, but creating efforts, fiscal policies, regulations to make significant advances in specific industries and sectors. I'm a climate justice activist um, as well as an artist. And so the past couple of, well, few years now, I've been fo solely focusing on the climate crisis and what we can do to inspire more people into action, especially people in my generation. Being an activist, I'll come into spaces and I will feel like I'm like, as, as some people may say, like a, a young snowflake who like cares too much <laughs> and is being told, you know, like, OK, calm down a bit. But we you know we're in a climate crisis. Like I want to fight as much as I can, push for it as much as I can, because at the end of the day, like I'm just fighting for a livable and healthy and joyful future for everyone. So what can activism be and what should it look like going forward? And what are some great examples people have seen within different fields of, of activism and taking action? There are things to be done today, next week, in a year and in a decade. A lot of the things that we have heard today have also to do with uh, how do we perceive place. And uh, maybe that's what I would like to bring into the game, that uh, a lot of the climate decisions are made on a very generic and level playing field where you might have the map of a country or a map of a city or <clears throat> the whole planet and again chess pieces are moved on that board decisions will be made and as we heard from um, uh, the colleague in Africa uh, how much do we actually know about these places so one of the things to try to con put things into context would be to know more and allow these voices the places and and uh, the context to come forward the key is that how do we break away each one of us, no matter where we are, away from that space of uh, uh, the lost futures and the lost narratives? Um, if you haven't 
been to COP26, most of what you would have heard is about the culprits and the countries that are creating the problem or not wanting to do enough. And there was a lot of talk about China and India. So there is a sense that the, the narrative, the mainstream narrative, the mainstream media somehow want to point fingers at countries that they see as, you know, the bad ones. And in this story, I think, you know, the whole climate change discussion and debate, we're all culprits. Activism for me is also about solidarity. And I think that point has been made. So if I have problems in Uganda related to floods, uh, it is happening in my backyard, but it needs to also be retailed out so that that story can travel further. The idea of, uh, of knowledge, understanding our world and understanding our connection with the world is so important and also not playing the blame game. I uh, live in California and have spent the last couple of summers in the High Sierra in uh, wildfire smoke and have gone to glaciers that were there in 2007 that are no longer there. So I've, I've, I've seen the damage and I think it's worldwide. Everybody's seen it. I went to COP26 in Glasgow. It was the first time I had been to one and I found it very impressive. And I want to say that it's a, the UN and it's kind of the General Assembly, all the nations together without a Security Council. And it has a, that good aspect of all the nations are on an equal footing in the COP process. It's also got a problem in that it runs on the consensus model where every nation has to agree or the statements don't go forward. And that inevitably makes it too slow. And I think that was what the main thing that George was registering in his opening remarks. But um, I would want to emphasize Lavagna's point that you can't throw out the baby with the bathwater. We're better off with COP than without it. It's necessary, but not sufficient. And so COP is kind of a spectacle in a society of the spectacle. You meet every year and you look at each other. And uh, I want to uh, register also what uh, Professor Ghosh said, that we should not just mark our promises to each other, but also the accomplishments that we've made and list those as well. Um, so seeing each other once a year to talk about climate, making promises that are intended from the start to ratchet up um, is, a, is a valid process. And, it, and since these are promises only and not legally binding treaties, you can maybe think of it as a kind of a, a marriage. We gather together, we make pledges to each other. You can break those pledges later, you can get divorced, but there's nowhere else to go. So here's my question to the experts. How do we compensate the petrostates? How do we pay ourselves to do the right things rather than the wrong things? And this is something we have been looking at for, for a long time now trying to understand the implications of rapid action on climate change for the, the large resource holders around the world. Just to, just to give one number on this, we have estimated that if the world pursues a trajectory towards net zero by 2050, then the, the income from, for those countries will, be, will drop by around about three quarters. So they will have to be surviving on three quarters less than what they, they currently have. So we absolutely need to start thinking about more innovative ways of, of getting those countries on side, making sure that they're part of the conversation when we, we talk about climate change, rather than just viewing them as, as a problem or viewing them as, as, um, as, as irrelevant to, to the discussions or the emission reductions that are needed. I'm often thinking we should be more paying attention to the fact that these are not economic or natural resources questions only. They do penetrate through the Petro state uh, society, politics, and leadership. And, and my God, what complexity that gives us. We saw last week the African Solar Industry Association report that showed across the whole of Africa only 0 0.9 gigawatts of new solar was installed last year, uh, the lowest since 2015. Only 0.5% of the world's solar was installed uh, in 2021. That's the lowest percentage since 2013. So as a science focused body, um, what can groups such as CCAG do in 2022 to help hold wealthy nations to account for breaking their promises to the global south? 
I actually really believe that in Western countries, we need to go back to basics and actually teach our history properly. We actually need people to understand what we did in the past. <laughs> what was the impact of colonization? What was the impact of global slavery? What is the impact of us causing, even in the 60s and 70s, major revolutions in petrochemical uh, countries because we wanted their oil? Kids don't know that. The global south knows this, okay? They know all this. They understand the pain and the anguish that they're going through now economically is because of that abuse. However, in an abusive relationship, if you don't actually have the abuser going, oh yeah, it was us, sorry, <laughs> you know, it's not going to work. And I think that is something we need to unpick. You know, a few days ago, Dave, I uh, was in a shop with my, with my nine-year-old daughter. We were picking up some stuff we wanted to bake together. Um, the shop had a sign, nice to see, nice to hold. If it's broken, consider it sold. I'm sure we've seen a sign like that in many places. Right. Uh, but somehow, uh, when we break the planet, uh, we say, no, it's not our responsibility to pay up. So I think the first answer to your question, you know, what can a science focused body do? No, we don't have to be scientists at all. We simply have to say, follow the same principle as you would follow anywhere else with regards to anything. You cause harm, you pay up.